on my mother's side, my mother's name was Parkinson, and her uh, grandfather, he came from Lancashire, and he arrived in the 1820s approximately uh, in Rawdon. When my ancestors arrived, there was roughly an equal number of English and French in Montreal. They came because Montreal was a booming city. There were a lot of Irish people here already. I think as to why they chose Montreal, Montreal was a massive fixture in Canada at the time, uh, and it had both a large English community and a large French community. And I know that church was um, the center of, of, of the Scottish community for those years. I also think that as farmers, they, um, they, they interacted a lot, the different farmers in the different rows. I think they, they traded ideas about, about crops and, and techniques and so forth. Uh, my uh, original ancestor in the early part of the 19th century that uh, I have some description of, I think interacted a lot with Francophone neighbors uh, who owned different farms. This is what's now NDG. My parents uh, left Italy after the uh, end of the Second World War. The country was ravaged uh, economically, uh, very unstable politically. Well, Hungary was in the middle of an uprising in 56. And my mother was fleeing from the Cultural Revolution in China. When we left Vietnam, we left on the very last day, April 30th, 1975. And uh, my parents, with the eight kids, they wanted to have a better future for us because they didn't know how it would be with the communists taking over from in the south. And so we took off on the very last boat. Well, I was born in 1977, which was two years into the Lebanese Civil War. And by 1982, uh, the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the Israeli military were having uh, a war in our neighborhood. Uh, so the neighborhood was destroyed and we had nowhere else to go, so we got on a boat and we left. My choice of Quebec goes all the way back to 1995, where at um, my last year at university in the UK, I chose to do an option in, on Quebec. I always knew that I wanted to speak, be able to live in, in more than one language than just English. So I chose Quebec in the craziest year, of course, the year of the referendum. We came in 1998, which means that uh, we didn't really have internet yet back at home. So we couldn't research and prepare and find and build that support system um, as people who immigrate now do. Um, so when we came, we felt quite lost. So everything was confusing. Everything was new. Everything was daunting. When you're an immigrant, um, you, you lose your network, right? They say your network is your net worth. We come to a new country, we become poor instantaneously. My grandparents, bilingual. <laughs> um, there was a lot of exchange early on between the French-speaking communities and the English-speaking communities, uh, and that's sort of just been passed down. Sometimes I wonder, though, if, like, my grandparents and my great aunts and uncles know more French than I do. Um, or maybe they're just more comfortable with it because it was just to get by. They worked on the farm together. They spoke English and French between each other. There was no politics or anything. And um, sometimes I'm not sure that I always feel that sort of comfort uh, when I speak in my second language. If I look back on what my grandparents told me when they were young and growing up, they only spoke English. They only had to speak English. Um, much like Charles said, the English community married within the English community and the French within the French. And if you knew a few words of French, that was great. And if the French people knew a few words of English, that was fine. Grandparents spoke perfect French, perfect Moroccan French, not Quebecois French. Um, but the, the thing is, is that they came here and then it was a product of the government policies that we ended up speaking English. Uh, my grandparents had to learn English. There was no English in their household. They spoke French and they spoke French to my parents. But my parents then, my, my dad went to an English school. And even beyond that, it's, it's, uh, many people have been speaking about it, how the Catholic school system wouldn't take the Jews, so the Protestant school system would take the Jews. As you know, the Catholic schools, even though my, both my parents spoke perfect French, 
uh, would not take us because they didn't want refugees to corrupt their pour l'en Québécois, which we would have done because my father was on the left. So yeah, they were right about that. Well, I'm very proud that I was one of the first students that was um, in the French immersion program in the Protestant school system. And unfortunately, it started at age 12, which is a bit late to learn a second or a third language. But my curriculum was accelerated before that so that I could start at grade seven to have only in French all the basic subjects. And uh, it was an honor. And I never felt like I had to learn French. I wanted to. I was very motivated. We uh, arrived under the auspices that my parents' French proficiency would uh, work out well for them here. My mother was a French teacher, but as an immigrant, no one would give her a job as a French teacher. There were four of us living in a tiny one-bedroom apartment all on top of each other. I was held back a year in school and put in a class decay. I felt alienated uh, from everyone around me because I, my French uh, was really non-existent at that point. I grew up bilingual. They're very proud of me. I'm referred to as the French kid in the family. Basically did all of my education in English and therefore, um, when I got onto the job market, I, I thought it, was, it would be a little challenging because my vocabulary was limited to basically just using it with friends with, um, while going shopping. In the beginning, it was actually um, quite hard. Like <laughs> I came home and I was exhausted and I had headaches. But after like three months, I remember I was speaking to my to my boss and, and she was like, wow, Catherine, like, look at you. Uh, you know, three months ago, you would have never spoken like that. And I would say that the quality of the French language education I received in um, in the region was just not up to par to help us to almost help us foster and thrive in that language. Um, that was only, what, 15 years ago. At that time, it wasn't it wasn't as well focused on. And now a lot of my former classmates, um, you know, lots of them who didn't get that chance to learn French in school and they came from Anglophone only families. A lot of them end up leaving the region because they just can't um, they can't do the work in, in French. It's not their fault. Um, but with what they grew up with, um, it's not possible for them to thrive. It was very important to my parents to send uh, myself and my younger brother to French high school because I think they were very uh, aware of the different uh, limitations that um, not being fully bilingual kind of created for them in their not only professional lives but their social lives and uh, they wanted my brother and I to have every opportunity so they they forced us to go to French high school, which was really a, a gift in retrospect. At the time, it didn't feel that way. So yeah, so my brother and I are fully bilingual. My brother uh, went on to pursue all of his uh, his med school, all of his studies in, in French and ended up uh, marrying a francophone. And uh, his life really um, took a, a different path. Growing up in the 90s as an Anglophone, it wasn't always amazing. From an Anglophone family that do not speak French, you know, my father tries, but my mom's family don't, uh, there were struggles as a, as a child to not be able to communicate with the other children that were only French. Um, I realized quickly in high school that if I wanted any success within the province, I'm really going to have to study French. And I ended up getting a job within the public where... You know, I was forced to speak French every day and then trying to become friends with people who were French just to get that language because it was always for me an embarrassment to have that English accent when I spoke the language and it's still there today. I went to English schools for elementary high school CJEP and then I made the decision to go to the Université de Montréal. And going to the Université de Montréal, I'm a keeper wearing Jew. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to get anti-Semitism. This is, this is going to be interesting. I have not heard a single word about me being Jewish. I have gotten so much abuse for being Anglo. I, I was not expecting that at all. So I said, you know what? Let's try something. I'm going to create the Comité des étudiants anglophones en droit de l'Université de Montréal. And I hear some people speak out about the club, and they say, well, we don't think that U of M should have an Anglophone club. It's a French school. If you want to be Anglo, you go to McGill. And then I had someone else say, if you give the Anglos an inch, they'll take a mile. 
But then I had people come out and say, you know what? I'm, I'm Francophone. My grandmother used to tell me about how they forced her to speak French, uh, forced her to speak English at the, at the Eton Center when they were serving people. That happened. Okay, that happened. But now it's different. And this is a service that they need. They're not being political. We should help integrate Anglophones. It was really hard growing up in my community as an Anglophone, going to an English school and not even knowing, um, you know, like some, some of my, like my French friends, if you will, they didn't even know that there was an English school. And then I was pegged as that English, that English girl. Like I was that English girl, which is why I know the accent had to be gone right away. When you have that accent on your French, um, it's so obvious. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's the majority of cases, but every now and then you'll get someone who criticizes your accent or criticizes the way that you speak. Um, and it hurts. You're like, I'm in my second language. I'm doing my best. Um, can you recognize that? <laughs> I love uh, the heartfelt nature of French culture here. Whenever I come back here from a, a unilingual place, when I start to hear the language, it's just a, it's a flow which, uh, which uh, I find thrilling, you know, it's a, uh, to, to have that kind of variety in, in the city where I live. I feel more a Montrealer than I do a Quebec or a Canadian. Um, I love the city. I love the people here. I've been involved in the stand-up comedy scene here in Montreal, not professionally, but as a hobby, uh, for about 10 years. And all the comedians perform in both languages easily. As a teacher, all my students were at least three languages, French being the primary language of instruction, but you know, able to converse in two or three other languages besides that. And to me, that's, that's the richness of our city. That's why I love it here. Interestingly, when I went back to Ukraine to visit after graduating university, I felt that I didn't belong there at all. So all of a sudden, I felt I had a bigger culture shock going there than I had here. I, I only thought of this uh, now as we're having this discussion. I don't know why. Um, I say that I'm Canadian. I say that I'm from Canada. Um, inevitably, now, I also always mention that I'm an immigrant. And I didn't for so many years. I would hide it. Now I own t-shirts that say immigrant. I own mugs. My headshots on all of my social media um, say immigrant on them as well. So now it's this balanced identity. Um, where do I belong? Um, I belong with my family. I belong with my friends. I belong with my community. Um, but um, there's still that inescapable feeling of otherness that I have learned to accept. I love Marina's immigrant t-shirt because I think a lot of us as immigrants, I, I identify, I see things that Marina says, I see things other immigrants say, and we have made a choice to come here. We're courageous people. This 15 year stretch that I've been living here is the longest I've lived in one place for my life, and I'm nearly 50. So I really, you know, this is home for me. I'm happy that my son has that. I, I moved all the time as a little girl. I'm so happy that he has that stability. and. Um, my husband's very, very Quebecois, and I love Quebecois culture. Um, I can't help but also feel very Canadian, though. I've always presented myself as a, a Chinese, English, Quebecer, who's fluently, you know, uh, I would have said bilingual, but I speak like four different languages, so uh, <laughs> polyglot, um, you know, and Canadian. But, and it's only like when my uh, mid, 20s when I started uh, traveling outside of Quebec that I realized to what degree I was a Quebecer. But um, like Mayer, right? I'm a fighter, you know? Uh, I define who I am. I define my identity, you know? I'm a Quebecer, sino Quebecois, right? And in that sense, right, um, I, I, I feel, you know, uh, totally part of Quebec. They might not always feel the same way, but that's their problem. Race has played a very big role in, in my life and the formulation of my own identity in Quebec. Um, one of the reasons for that is this kind of assumption that because, you know, if you're a person of color, you can't really be from here. It's, it's, it's like a, a party or a dinner, right? When you're in a family, whether you like each other or not, you're at the dinner table and things happen there. But if you're on the outside, you can never sit at the dinner table. So my policy uh, for the last couple of years is really to come uninvited to the table, 
uh, you know, knock on the door, crash the door down, crash the party, but always make sure that I bring something, right? Like any family or any meal, you've got to bring something that you can contribute, that you can use to enrich that experience. Even I'm starting to realize how much that sort of the old English names for regions are starting to disappear. Even in my mom's generation, some of the traditional names for like some of the hills or the lakes or the rivers, they're gone. <laughs> and I'm only just starting to retrace them back with the help of like my great uncles, my great aunts or books that were written in the 1800s about it. And I think that's important. And I think it's really important for, for my generation, you know, me, my cousins, other people uh, who, who have connections and roots down home to sort of make sure we make sure that history isn't lost um, and that culture isn't lost. A lot of the Anglophones who have stayed, they want, they, they like French, they know French, they, their children are going to French schools. I went to French school, my brother went to French school. We are trying to assimilate and integrate and yet a lot of the time when you read the newspapers we're still being blamed for this decline and I don't get it. How strongly do you feel you belong in Quebec?